Hello everybody. My name is Prentice Boxdale and I hope that you have you enjoying this YouTube channel. Will you please hit the subscribe and like button? And y'all are gonna have a hallelujah good time, but we got many more to come. And let's have a good time together. Well, if the sky above you are gray, you are feeling so blue. If your care and burden seem great all the whole day through, there is a silver lining that shines.
after the year was expired, at the time when kings go forth to battle, that David sent Joab and his servants with him, and all Israel, and they destroyed the children of Ammon and besieged Rabbah. But David tarried still at Jerusalem, and it came to pass in an even time that David arose from off his bed and walked upon the roof of the king's house, and from the roof he saw a woman washing herself. And the woman was very beautiful to look upon. And David sent and inquired after the woman. And one said, Is not this Bathsheba the daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uranah, the Hittite? And David sent messengers and messengers and took her. And she came in unto him, and he lay with her. For she was purified from her uncleanliness, and she returned into her house. And the woman conceived, and sent and told David, and said, I am with child. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading of his word, to the hearers and the doers. Humble yourself in the sight of the Lord.
We thank you for the examples he set for us, Heavenly Father. We thank you for having his lesson so perfectly prepared each and every Sunday, Heavenly Father. We thank you for the example he set in his life, Heavenly Father, and the example he set in his death, Heavenly Father, for he never left you, Heavenly Father. Amen. Heavenly Father, at this time, we'd like to say a special prayer for the speaker who will carry on our gospel meeting this week, Heavenly Father. We ask that you continue to be with Brother Andrew Carney and his family, Heavenly Father, for many years to come. And we pray that the message that he puts out this week will not fall upon deaf ears, Heavenly Father, but penetrate our hearts to make us better citizens in your kingdom, Heavenly Father, that we may serve you better and serve mankind better also. Heavenly Father, thank you for all the many blessings you bestow upon us that we take for granted each and every day, such as our health, our strength, food, shelter, clothing, jobs, and I can go on and on, Heavenly Father. And you know, you if we look deep enough, we'd find out that we have more blessings than we have problems. Yes. Heavenly Father, we want to say thank you for sending your son to die for each and every one of us, Heavenly Father. And we ask that we take in all that you have to offer us, Heavenly Father, before it's everlasting and eternally too late. Heavenly Father, we'd like to pray for those that are in hospitals. We pray for the doctors and nurses that are in charge of their care. We pray for those that are behind prison walls, Heavenly Father, that you lift out their lives, that they may correct themselves before it's everlasting and eternally too late. Heavenly Father, we pray for the churches of Christ throughout the world, that they not water down your word, Heavenly Father, but they pour it out the way it is written, Heavenly Father, without an addition or subtraction. Heavenly Father, thank you once again for all the things you blessed us with and all the blessings you will give us in the future, Heavenly Father. These and other blessings we ask in your Son, Jesus Christ's name. Let the church say, Amen. 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 <coughs> Today's song of invitation will be coming from page number 640. Page number 640. There is beyond the edge of blue a God transcend from human side said he tipped his skies with heavenly hue and framed the world with his great mind. There is a God, he is alive, and if we need him and we survive.
Thank you. Ready? 
Let's get on the train. Come on. We have a great day and a great week. Serving, praising God. We have with us a speaker today in Australia, but he visited with us. A man that is well known among, among the community, among the state. He had gone from Texas to uh, Michigan. He is alumni of the Southwest Christian College. He had preached the gospel for several years. How long? I don't know. How long? For a long, for a long time. Perhaps, perhaps like 50 years, I don't know. It was a long time. He is a co minister of the Church of Christ on his boulevard. He is married to the former Betty Critical. Uh, I said former, I think you correct me, but I'm so glad to have with you today. He preached in what? Michigan. He preached in Indiana. In other various states. A man well known. He also he majored in English. Good to have him today. Our speaker today, rest of the week, Brother Andrew Cuddy Jr. Evangelist. Please stand. I once was lost in sin, but Jesus took me in.
I want you to know that I do not take this lightly. It is a great privilege to have been invited to come. I will assure you that I will do everything in my power to fulfill the job for which I have been called to fulfill. I will do my part, and I ask you, Isaac, do your part. Do your part, and I will do your part, my part. And we all know God's going to do his part. I want to commend you for the baptisms. I read in the bulletin you had some baptisms last Sunday. That is good news. Whenever I hear of souls that are saved, causes my heart to rejoice. I wasn't here, didn't witness it, but I rejoice in knowing that there were souls saved on last Lord's Day. We're hopeful that souls will be saved this week as well. I'm not going to uh, be guilty of calling a few names, not calling everybody's name that I should have called, but uh, I want to want you to meet my other half, okay. Betty Blanche Whitaker Kearney. Okay. She is to my right, and her brother, my brother-in-law, is here, Eugene Whitaker. Would the two of you stand at this time? If it isn't an imposition. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Appreciate your standing, and appreciate your being here. Others will be here this afternoon, God willing, from OHB. Uh, others of my family, as well as other members at the OHB family of God. Is everybody doing well? Everybody all right? We're going to have a great time together. Let's serve the Lord in the beauty of holiness. So good to see all these faces. And uh, some of you possibly are here because this is your homecoming. Or this is the beginning of your gospel meeting. We appreciate that so very, very, very much. We want to go to 2 Samuel chapter 11, but let me mention the singing. I've been inspired. I have been uplifted by your devotion. This young man has done an excellent job. Young brother Kennedy, right? Yeah. Done an excellent job. His father better look out. <laughs> he had better look out. He did an excellent job. I was very much so impressed. And also impressed with the prayer that was prayed by my cousin. Y'all didn't know that was my cousin, did you? I understand he is now deacon here. So good to know that. So good to know that. We had him come preach for us at OHB. I guess it was last year. We must have him again on the field Sunday in the AM. He did an excellent job. I just love your minister. He and I go back a long, long way. We were at NCI together as well a long time ago. Now, if I tell you how long ago, y'all have an idea how old I am. And I'm trying to conceal that. Zach was talking about my having preached a long time. I will at least tell you that. 51 years, 51 years, now that's a long time to be preaching the gospel of Christ. And I love it more and more every day, love it more and more. Second Samuel chapter 11, verses 1 through 5 have been beautifully read, but if you don't mind, I'd like to reread those verses and go just a little bit further. Second Samuel chapter 11. I want to concern myself with verses 1 through 9. Now some of you don't know me. You've never heard me preach. If you are a member of the church that I'm just your brother that you haven't met before. But you're meeting me today. So we want to let our hair down. Let's just have a great time serving the Lord. Second Samuel 11. Good to see the smart sitting together, to see Brother Smart here, and to see uh, F.B. Francis here. We just love all of you. It's so good to see you all sitting there. Second Samuel 11, the Bible says that it came to pass after the year was expired 
at the time when kings go forth to battle, that David sent Joab and his servants with him and all Israel. And they destroyed the children of Ammon and besieged Rabbi. But David tarried still at Jerusalem. And it came to pass. In an even tide that David arose from off his bed and walked up on the roof of the king's house. And from the roof he saw a woman washing herself. The woman was very beautiful to look upon. David sent an inquiry after the woman, and one said, Is not this Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite? David sent messengers and took her. She came in unto him, and he lay with her, for she was purified from her uncleanness she returned unto her house. And the woman conceived and sent and told David and said, I am with child. David sent to Joab, saying, Send me Uriah the Hittite. And Joab sent Uriah to David. When Uriah was come unto him, David demanded of him how Joab did, and how the people did, and how the war prospered. David said to Uriah, Go down to thy house and wash thy feet. Uriah departed out of the king's house, and there followed him a mess of meat from the king. But Uriah slept at the door of the king's house with all the servants of his lord, and went not down to his house. For a few minutes today, I'd like to arrest your attention, if I might, on a lesson from the subject, if failure were fatal, if failure were fatal, y'all have time for this? Yes. The text just read will be discussed in context with the lesson. We recognize Abraham Lincoln as one of the greatest presidents in our history. Thousands of speeches are given wherein a quote from this great man is given. What we may not know is that he failed in no less than 11 times prior to his being elected president of the U.S. of A. He failed in business in 1831, was defeated for the legislature in 1832, failed again in business in 1833, had a nervous breakdown in 1836, was defeated for the Speaker of the House in 1838, was defeated for elector in 1840 was defeated for Congress in 1843, okay. was defeated again for the same office in 1846, was defeated for Vice President in 1856. He tried the Senate once more in 1858, but was defeated. Lesser men would not have even put their names in the running to be adulterated. But Lincoln did. He became the president of the United States of America. Few of us have failed as did Lincoln. But then few of us have succeeded as did Lincoln. If any of us has. And I doubt that seriously. Perhaps there is a correlation between the number of times we're willing to fail and the greatness of the success we ultimately achieve. While our successes and failures do not match Lincoln's, we have all experienced some failures in life. In fact, it is probably safe to say that all of us yes, 
who are of age yes, fall into one of the following categories. Yes, a. Failing. B. Living with the consequences of failure. C. Recovering from failure. D. Facing failure in the eye. Or E. Fearing failure in the future. Some present may be failing this very moment. We're doing things we know we ought not to be doing. And we're leaving off things that we should not leave off. Our failure may be an attitude or action, but there it is. It may be as visible to the world as a pimple on the end of the nose. Or it may be hidden to all eyes except ours and God's. But we're there, and we know it. For others, it might be an undesirable habit that we decided to will, but don't seem to be able to whip it. You know, habits have a way of getting at us. When we're forming them, we say to ourselves, oh, I can quit any time I get ready. Yeah. And then after we're hooked, yes, we say we can quit any, any way we try. That's the devil. Yes, the devil that is prompting that. Maybe your losing battle is with depression, with doubt, fear, anxiety, or any one of the thousand and one other things that knock us to the canvas when we are looking. For others, the failure may be in remission, so to speak. Now we live with the consequences. Perhaps it is an unhappy marriage with which we live. We gave up the fighting, if it ever existed. And we just live now with toleration. We just tolerate the situation we're in. We made our bed lumpy, so we just lie in it. Oh, somebody's heard this before. If you make your bed hard, just lie in it. Then there are those who are recovering from other types of failure. Some are recovering from divorce. Maybe not in this audience, and I hope that such is true. Others may be recovering from failed businesses, from lost jobs, unwise investments, or their own peculiar failure. The failure is not yet a reality for some. We're staring it in the eye, however. Unemployment, bankruptcy, divorce, and other failures of the same species are circling over our heads. Lord have mercy. Yeah. Failure is not impending for some of us, not so far as we know. But we borrow from the distant future and feel failure in old age. Yeah. We worry yeah. whether our health is going to fail us. We worry whether our money is going to run out before we run out. The future is uncertain, but we are certain of one thing. It holds failure for us. That is negativity at its best. With failure so widespread, we are forced to conclude that if failure were fatal, we would all be dead because we were all bad and we are not dead. Some have felt that death is to be, be preferred to failure. So much so that they have decided to take the easy way out. I call it the coward's way out. 
they commit suicide. If that's not dumb with a capital D, I don't know what is. I have some good news for you, church. Some good news for you. God can use those who have failed. In fact, failure is so widespread in the Bible that we really have to wonder okay. if God works with anything but recycled failure. Amen. Are you listening? Moses failed. Yes, he did. Moses failed. God had intended that Moses would be the liberator. He would lead the children of Israel out of Egypt. But he didn't mean for Moses to kill off the Egyptians one by one with his own hands. I'm talking to you from Exodus chapter 2. Some of you know that Moses was a Hebrew. A decree had been sent out by Pharaoh that all the poor babies were to be killed. Moses' parents would not kill him, but his mother kept him as long as she could, secret, don't you see, hidden in the home. And then she made an ark. She made something that would float on the river, the Nile River. She put Moses on the Nile River, left Miriam, his sister, to watch. And as fate would have it, Pharaoh's daughter found that bundle of joy. She loved it. She carried it home. She named him Moses, which means thrown out of the Are y'all listening? That's what the word means. So Moses grew up. In Pharaoh's house. He was the stepson of Pharaoh. At 40 years of age, Moses went out and viewed his fellow Hebrews. And he saw an Egyptian soldier berating and misusing and abusing one of the Hebrews. So Moses looked right and left. He looked to see if anybody saw him. He killed that Egyptian, hid his body in the sand. The very next day, he saw two fellow Hebrews at odds with one another, confrontational, don't you see? And he said to the one that was abusing his brother, you shouldn't do him like that. So he said, who made you a prince over us? Are you going to kill me like you killed the Egyptian yesterday? Moses knew his secret was no longer secret. He had to leave Egypt. He dwelt in the city of Midian. But my point, Moses failed. He had to flee Egypt. Read more about this in the book of Acts, chapter 7, 23 through 30. Samuel failed. Samuel had grown up in the house of Eli, the priest. And having witnessed the shame that Eli's sons brought upon him, Samuel had probably vowed that no son of his would ever act like that. He would see to it that his sons did not act like that. But Samuel's sons followed the path of Eli's sons and not the path of that godly father. Read 1 Samuel chapter 8, verses 1 through 3. As a matter of fact, I want to turn there and read those verses. But let me tell you about how wicked his sons were. Samuel's sons were so wicked until the people came to Samuel and said, you're getting old. Yeah. You're an old man now, and your sons don't follow in your steps. I want, we want you to make us a king over us. Yeah. Make us a king so we can be like the other nations. Oh, that bothered Samuel something terrible. You know, when things don't go the way you want them to go, don't get mad. Go talk to God. 
Samuel went and talked to God about it. And God said, give them what they want. They haven't rejected you, but they have rejected me from being the leader. Give them what they want. As a song, give the people what they want. That's a deviation there. Anyway, God said, give them what they want. But tell them what to expect. Tell them what a king is going to require of them. And he did that. And the people said, we still want a king over us. Let me look at 1 Samuel 8, 1 through 3. And it came to pass when Samuel was old, right. that he made his sons judges over Israel. Right. Now the name of his firstborn was Joel, and the name of his second, Abiah. They were judges in Beersheba. Right. And his sons walked not in his ways, but turned aside after Luca to bribes. Perverted church. <laughs> Wicked boys. Wicked sons that made a change in the progression. No longer would Israel be under judges, but now they will be under kings. First right. Samuel chapter 8. Not only did Moses fail, not only did Samuel fail, but David failed. Y'all ready for this? The sweet singer of Israel. The man after God's own heart. Are you still listening? David failed. God had given him success after success. Victory upon top of victories. And there were more where these came from. But David found himself on top. And in all likelihood, boy, he failed. Our text comes into focus now. During the time when kings usually would go out to war, David decided to stay at home. Kings usually would go out to war with their armies. Don't you see? But David stayed at home. And he took a walk on the balcony of the palace. And he saw a woman bathing herself. So he inquired, who is this? Bad mama All right. Y'all not going to find that in the Bible. <laughs> who is this woman? And they said to him, is not this Bathsheba the wife of Uriah the Hittite? That should have been enough. That should have been enough. David had her brought to him. He's the king. They lay together. Then she went on home. If y'all don't understand what lay together means, it's all right. Don't worry about it. She went on back home. And then... She sends word to David. I'm praying. Can't you just see the wheels begin to turn? Here this woman is pregnant. Her husband is away in battle. I've got to do something. He sends a message to Joel, captain of the king's army. Send Uriah the Hittite home. Immediately. He sent him home. He goes in and confers with David. David wants to know how Joab is doing, how the other soldiers are doing, how the battle is progressing. Then he says, Now go on home. Go on home and wash yourself. Wash your feet. And thou followed him. A mess of meat. A feast fit for a king. But Uriah the Hittite didn't go home. He slept at the king's door with the other servants. The next day, somebody tells David, Uriah didn't go home. So he had 
has Uriah to come in. And he talks to him. Didn't you come from a long journey? Why didn't you go home? Be in comfort. I like what he said. I'm going to take time to read it. He said something that was very beautiful here. And it's worthy of note. I'm talking to you from 2 Samuel chapter 12. That's just one verse that I want to read to you. Chapter 11 it is, verse 11. And Uriah said unto David, The ark and his and Judah abide in tents. And my Lord took them. And the servants of my Lord are encamped in the open field. Shall I then go into mine house to eat and to drink and to lie with my wife as thou livest? And as thy soul liveth, I will not do this thing. Is that dedication or what? Yes. I will not do this thing because of the situation that exists out there. David said, well, remain here this day and tomorrow also. And then I will send you back to the battle. David got a three-day pass for Uriah. Y'all stay with me now. That's the first day when he went to David and gave a report on the war. David said, now go on to your house. But instead he slept at the king's door. So this is the second day now. David gets him drunk. They drink together. David feels like if I'm getting drunk, maybe he'll go home. But he didn't. He slept with the servants again. So now it's the next day, third day. Goes in unto David. And David gives him a message, a letter to take back to Joel, the captain of the host. Put this man on the front row in back. Oh, isn't that something? Man is carrying his own death mark. Put this man on the front row in battle. And then move back from him. Sure enough, that's what Joab did. Put him in a place where valiant soldiers were fighting. And sure enough, he was killed. Joab then sends a messenger to tell David he's dead. Uriah the Hittite is dead. I said David failed. You see, he had moral failure heaped upon moral failure. Right. David failed. Yeah. Moses failed. Yeah. Samuel failed. Yeah. David failed. Yeah. Peter failed. Yeah. Yes, he did. Yes, sir. Simon. Yes. Cephas failed. He had been so sure of himself. He was braggadocious. When you start bragging on yourself, get ready for failure. Write this down on your memorandum pad. When you start bragging on yourself, you're getting ready to fail. When you boast on yourself about what you have, what you can do, where you been? Where you going? How expensive your house is? What kind of car you drive? Get ready to pay. Here's what I read in my Bible. Over there in Proverbs 27 and verse 2. Let another man praise you. I didn't know that was there, did you? Let another man praise you. Don't praise yourself. Let somebody else praise you. Peter was so sure of himself. He said to the master in Matthew 26, All of them may be offended because of you, but not I. Never will I be offended. What a positive thing. 
thinker, Peter was, but positive thinking failed. You see, Jesus said to Peter, still in this text, Matthew 26, Peter, before the cock crows, you're going to deny me three times. Three times you're going to deny me. Sure enough, just like Jesus said he would, he did just that. He didn't deny him once or twice, but three times. Matter of fact, it got so bad, he started cursing and swearing. Yeah. I'm still talking about Peter, y'all. Peter cursed and swore that he didn't know the Lord. Hey, hey, hey. I have some more good news for you. We all like good news, don't we? We hear enough bad news. It's suddenly and refreshing to hear some good news. Not a single one of these men that I've talked about was thrown away by God. They were all recycled. Moses did lead Israel out of Egypt. Samuel served God until the day of his death. And while he was denied the privilege of anointing his sons to succeed him, he was privileged to anoint the first two kings of Israel. David was forgiven for his sins, and he was used as the standard by which all succeeding kings of Israel were judged. First Kings 11 and 4. And verse 33, Peter recovered from his failure and he opened the doors of the church. Yes, he did in Acts chapter 2. He opened the doors of the church to the Gentiles in Acts chapter 10 when he opened the doors to Cornelius and his house. Failure isn't fatal unless it is final. And it isn't final if we get up one more time, then we go down. Oh, somebody missed that. I must say it again. Failure isn't fatal unless it is final. And it isn't final if we get up one more time, then we go down. Have you failed? Are you failing? That's a voice that says to you, stay there. Stay there. Just stay there. That's Satan. That's Lucifer. Telling you to throw in the towel. Give up. But then there's another voice that says, get up. Get up. Why throw in the towel when victory is just ahead? Get up! That's the voice of God. We ought to get up. Get up one more time. Then we go down. I've been talking to you about failure. I have made the point that failure is not faith. And I stand behind that 100%. We'll debate anyone on this issue. But I'm changing my tune now as I close. Right. There is a failure that's faithful. Are you listening? There's a failure that is faithful. Anyone that refuses to bow to heaven's will, that failure is faithful. It will bring some terrible results. Listen to what Jesus said in John 8, 21 and 24. Except ye believe that I am he, ye shall die in your sins. And if you die in your sins where I am, you can't come. Doesn't that sound fatal? Listen further. It's Luke 13 and 3. I tell you that. Except ye repent, ye shall all likewise perish. In that fatal Mark 16, 15 and 16. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be damned. Damn. Isn't that fatal? You're here today. 
and you haven't obeyed the gospel of Christ. The steps are very simple. Faith, repentance, confession, baptism. You haven't gone through those steps and become a member of the church. Your failure will prove fatal in the end. Do something about it today. I'm not talking about next week. Do something about it today. Jesus says, it's Revelation chapter 3. Behold, I stand at your door now. If any man will hear my voice and open the door, I'll come in unto him and sup with him. And he will, be. will you open your heart's door today? Let Jesus in. Let him come and be the predominant factor in your life. I'm not talking about being the second fellow. Let it be the predominant factor in your life. Somebody's here today. You've obeyed the gospel. But you've strayed along the way. You have obeyed, but you haven't stayed. The Lord is calling for you to come back home. Come back home. Renew your covenant with the Lord. Rededicate your life to him so that your failure will not prove faith. Repentance, confession, and prayer is the way back. Heaven is waiting. Jesus is pleading. Mercy is lingering. The church is praying. Come now as we stand to sing the invitation of
invite you out to the Church of Christ on the east side at 4040 Mary Dale Drive, Nashville, Tennessee, 37207. Our Sunday school starts at 930, worship service at 1030 a.m., Wednesday night at 7 o'clock. We would love to have you come to be part and worship a part of the family and worship with us. Amen. Show. Sure. 